Oh, by the way, whatever happened to that one NPC fellow you always hang with? Ah, yeah, the NPC. Gosh, I haven't seen him since that one review. Yeah. I remember it like it was several months ago. Manga! Konnichiwa, I'm the Manga Man. And today we're going to be talking about the tournament genre. The tournament genre is a subset genre to the sports genre. And I say this because sports genre anime are more than likely to have tournaments in them. The tournament genre itself is mainly used as a tool for manga and anime creators as a way of extending out the storyline or just giving us a good example to see people beat each other up. Now the manga creators, or mangaka as they are also known, would like to make us think that the tournament is an integral part of the storyline. Sometimes this is true, but most of the time for me I find it to be just a glorified filler. Now I'm not saying that tournament manga are bad or anything, there have been a lot of good examples of good tournament use in manga. Well, take the Dragon Ball series for example. But on the flip side, there have also been anime such as Yu Yu Hakusho, Shaman King, and Yu-Gi-Oh! that have seemed to overuse the tournament so much so that it becomes the regular plot of the story. And that's why I'm going to- Aye. NPC, what are you doing here? Relax, I'm unarmed. Oh, well. Okay, then. <laughs> so, what are you up to? Oh, well, I was uh, talking about tournament mangas and anime. Ah, I've got something you could review, then. Oh, well, that's nice, but I actually I, I, have... I, 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 I insist. Oh, uh, that's cool, but I uh, have this... No, 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 there's something that's gotta be said, and there'll never be a better time than now. I know what you're saying, but I have this plan for such a... You said... That... I lied. So, what did you have in mind? <laughs> This. <laughs> Mayor! This is the ultimate showdown. A ultimate destiny. Good guys, bad guys, and explosions. As far as the eye can see, and only one will survive. I wonder who it will be. Showdown of Ultimate Destiny. I thought it was pronounced Mar. Yeah, I thought it was pronounced Mare. Well, whatever it's called, it's a perfect example of a tournament manga that goes completely awry. Before we go any further, let's just specify that this review is being based on the manga solely and not the anime. From a few clips we've seen, we can tell that the story differs at least slightly from the original manga in the anime. However, neither of us have seen it all the way through yet, so we can't really judge it, not yet at least. And besides, it's been a while since I've done a manga review. The cover art ranges from decent to lazy to just plain odd to downright terrible. The best of the bunch would probably have to be volume 10, and that's simply because of its simplicity. The artwork is easy on the eyes, and it conveys some of the story's more heartwarming elements. On the opposite end of the spectrum is Volume 9. Now, ignoring the fact that the background is just a swirling purple mass, there is also the perspective problems on Ginta. Just looking at his hand that's coming straight at us is too small in proportion to his head and the rest of the body. I mean, look at his hand on the other end right there. How is it coming out at that angle? And plus, the undershadow does little to help the piece. In fact, it makes the perspective even worse to look at. It's just a very awkwardly drawn cover. Most of the other covers are your pretty standard by the book fan, most of which consisting of the cliché group shot. I mean, what could be more cliché than just having the main characters coming at the reader? It's like, ooh, look at us, we're so badass. On a whole, the covers are cheap and unimpressive, without one ever really standing out as memorable. The story starts out much like any other escapist fantasy, in a high school. Ah! 
Here we are introduced to the main protagonist, Ginta. Ginta can best be described as being a complete loser, with having no academic, athletic, or social skills to speak of. To make matters worse, he is more delusional than the kid from Sidekicks. You see, for a while now, Ginta has been having these dreams about being an RPG fantasy hero in a magical world, and with each passing day, these dreams become more and more intense and realistic. I wonder where this could possibly be going. The suspense is killing me. So, of course, an interdimensional gateway opens up to Ginta right in the middle of his classroom. And it's stationed by a creepy nightmare clown. There's cotton candy and rides and all sorts of surprises down here. And balloons, too. Do they float? Oh, yes. They float. Georgie. They float. So an interdimensional creepy carnival gate pops out of nowhere, what would your first reaction be? Why, of course, it's to jump blindly into the dirty little clown hole. Anyway, before we actually see how deep the rabbit hole goes, there's something I want to make a note of. One element of Mar... Mare. Whatever. ...is that Ginta occasionally looks back on the world he left behind. We even see Ginta's mom on the verge of a nervous breakdown. This has earned mild acclaim, and I'll admit that it puts it ahead of other series in this genre, but it doesn't really add all that much to the story. While it does acknowledge this oft-forgotten aspect of escapist fantasy, it doesn't actually do anything with it. It doesn't drive the plot or even affect it. It's just there. It's not like there was a lack of possibilities with this. I remind you, the gate that Ginta traveled through appeared in his classroom. There were dozens of witnesses and yet no one seems to be investigating this. People have grasped onto the craziest alien conspiracy theories for years, and when a real interdimensional phenomenon happens in broad daylight, the world just ignores it. If there are people looking into this, we never see them or hear about them. From start to finish, it's no different than if Ginta just ran away and joined the circus. And rant over. Huh. Right. And so Gint is transported to the fantastical world of Mar. Mar. Whatever. It's here that Ginta encounters such amazing creatures such as fairies, vegetarian werewolves, and talking rocks. They look like good, strong characters, don't they? And that's about as diverse as it gets. Maybe there's more, but we never see any. And the ones that we do see are just minor side characters. Upon arriving in this new world, he now possesses superior strength and stamina, and no longer needs glasses. Huh. Why does that sound so familiar? Not long after, it's explained that this is a result of Mare... Mar. Whatever having slightly less gravity than Earth. I normally wouldn't complain since I don't know all the science behind it, but what I do know is that gravity DOESN'T AFFECT YOUR EYESIGHT! During Ginta's travels, he encounters a number of new friends along the way. A major motif you'll probably notice is that all of them are based on famous fantasy characters. Such as... Dorothy the Teenage Witch. <laughs> Which, I guess, is a combination of Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz and The Wicked Witch of the West. Her goals at the beginning are collecting rare treasures and getting into Ginta's pants. After witnessing the boy's phenomenal powers, she decides to trick Ginta into acquiring a rare and powerful artifact, known as Babo. Wow, a kendama toy. Neat. Turns out Babo is our next companion that will be joining Ginta on his travels, for he is a living kendama toy, aka a ball and hammer toy similar to ball and a cup. Ah uh, yes, weaponizing a children's plaything. Brilliant! Alright, tough guy, watch this! Ah! 
We'll explain more on what Babo is later. For right now, all you need to know is that he's Ginta's weapon of choice. As for Babo's personality, he constantly refers to himself as a gentleman. Not that this keeps him from acting like a bastard to Ginta when they first meet. At least until Ginta ends up saving his life. Gee, where have I heard this before? Oh, and uh, he has amnesia. Sure, why not? In the world of fiction, amnesia is more frequent than the common goddamn cold. Later on, Ginta will encounter Jack, based off of the fairy tale of Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack is a farm boy who will be the underdog character as well as Ginta's best friend. Like most underdog characters, Jack will start off incompetent and unskilled at the beginning, but will later on grow to uh, mediocrity and won't really outshine the hero at all. Basically, he's just there to make Ginta look good. As a farm boy and a user of earth magic, Jack's weapon of choice is the shovel, the most deadliest weapon since the Kendama. <laughs> what you gonna attack me with next? Marbles? <laughs> <laughs> Next, we meet Alvis. And the chipmunks? No. Actually, he's supposed to be Peter Pan, even though he looks and acts like a bad Sasuke cosplayer. To add even more comparisons to Sasuke, Alvis was also given a cursed seal of his own, known as the Zombie Tattoo, given to him by Phantom, one of the main villains of the series. It was also he that brought Ginta over to this Never Never Land, thanks to the creepy clown gate. Ah, take it away, take it away! Alvis' backstory is that he tried to be a soldier in a war that happened many years ago, but because he was just a kid, he wasn't allowed to fight. Also, Alvis has a fairy. She contributes nothing except what fairies usually hey, contribute. Listen, hey, listen, hey, listen, hey, listen. Next, we have Edward, a talking dog and servant to a princess. And when we meet him, he is trying his best to save her by falling asleep. Truly, he is the most loyal of friends. It turns out, Edward shares his body with a man named Alan, and they change places based on their sleep cycles. Alan is the oldest and most seasoned fighter among our heroes. Now, here's my question. Even if they aren't always loyal, you can still tell which character is based on what fairy tale. But with Edward and Alan? What is this I don't even... The closest guess I can make is a reverse werewolf, but even that's a stretch. Is there just some famous legend I've been in the dark about this whole time? In a frozen castle, Ginta and Jack encounter the next character, Snow, based on Snow White from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Could you get any more literal than that? Anyways, she is the princess and generic love interest of the series, and she has just about as much character development as Princess Peach. We learn from her that she has an evil stepmother, which is later revealed to be the queen in charge of all the chess pieces. Another peculiar thing to note is that she looks identical to Ginta's friend Koyuki from the real world. Uh, more on that a little later. Finally, we have Nanashi, the King of Thieves. Not to be confused with Jin, the King of Bandits. His main goals are avenging his fallen comrades and getting into everyone's pants. Oh, and he also has amnesia. Told you it was frequent. 